a, a slide talk. And um, I should say at the beginning that it's joint work with Matt Nopleby, Ahmad Barami, and Miguel Rodriguez. Um, <clears throat> Ahmad and Matt uh, are, are, were postdocs at Duke. Ahmad is now with uh, Muriel Madad at MIT. And Matt is going to be an assistant professor at Wayne State starting in August, I think. And the genesis of this work was really Matt Nokelby. Now, I. So if you're a graduate student in the States and you're interested in an academic job, you look at the ads at the back of Spectrum and you look to see what people are advertising for. And Matt got his PhD with Banan Azang at Rice and he worked on wireless communication and lattice, lattice coding for wireless communication. And when he looked in Spectrum, uh, what he saw was not a lot of ads for wireless communication and a lot of ads for signal processing. And so my job as his um, uh, postdoc advisor was to try and find a way to represent what he knew as signal processing. So to, uh, to turn knowing wireless communication into an advantage for getting an academic job in signal processing. Um, now, so the, the, um, the, the, um, so what I'm going to try and convince you of is that um, information theory, the stuff that you know, has something to say about machine learning. And it would be hard to find a hotter subject than machine learning at the current time. So this is um, a slide that talks about Google in June 2012. Uh, designing a deep neural network to classify, to find out what was important in YouTube. And um, what Google discovered is that cats were really important. And so a byproduct of this, uh, this, this um, scientific exploration was what you might think of as a neuron for detecting cats. A lot of internet videos involved. Um, second example is Facebook. So last year, Facebook unveiled DeepFace. Uh, what was DeepFace? I mean, Facebook, of course, has a lot of faces. And they, um, they trained on, on the faces that they have in Facebook images. And they learned discriminative facial features. They built one of these deep convolutional nets that, uh, that learned <coughs> facial features. And then they took the facial features that they learned and they applied them to the celebrity face database, so labeled faces in the wild. And they achieved an accuracy of 97.25%, which is about as well as humans classify celebrities. So this, clearly the, the world has um, advanced. Um, this is a picture of Jeff Hinton from University of Toronto. And he's smiling. And the reason that he's smiling is that his company, DNN Research, has just been acquired by Google. And uh, so Jeff is someone who has been a pioneer in, in neural networks since the 1980s. And uh, is, is one of the foremost researchers in deep convolutional nets. And what we wanted to think about, and, and I mean Jeff is also um, 
not famous for his regard for, if you like, theory. Um, so, in, in, a, in a sense, you, you always have a little bit of a suspicion that, that uh, Jeff believes that if you just gave him a big enough computer, there's nothing he couldn't solve. And so, what we wanted to do was to um, see if we could show that that wasn't true. So, to come up with problems that he couldn't solve, even if you gave him a big enough computer. So, I'm going to <clears throat> talk about learning, and I'm going to talk about classification. And I'm going to try and bring information theory to bear upon each one of them. <coughs> so, in, in learning, we have uh, some set of training examples, labeled or unlabeled, and we build some kind of neural network. So, we, we develop a classifier function. Maybe we're looking for faces, maybe we're looking for cats. Um, the, the output is this neural network. Uh, classification. We have data samples rather than training samples, and we try and classify them. Are they humans? Are they cats? And we're interested in how many times we make a mistake. Now, one of the things we're interested in is how many training samples do we actually have to see? Um, In, in some sense, this question is, it's a little bit like quantum computing, yes? You know, is quantum computing possible? Well, there are three possible answers. Answer number one is, it's impossible. Answer number two is, it's possible and it's easy. Answer number three is, it's possible, but it's very, very hard and you have to have lots of resources. Now, our NSA agency obviously prefers that the answer is number three. Right. And it's a little bit like that with Facebook. Right? Is, is learning easy or is it hard? I mean, if, if you're Facebook, you want learning to be really, really hard and you need a lot of training images. Because they have a lot of training images. So, you want to know how much training is really necessary. Uh, so, if you're thinking about training, you know you're in, your, in your gut that the more you see, the better you'll be able to do. And what we want to understand mathematically is what the shape of that, uh, that boundary uh, looks like. In, in classification, we it's a different question. Um, we can we can um, we can work with high fidelity images, or we can work with uh, lower dimensional um, images that do a less good job of representation. We still want to be able to classify. We we feel that. Um, The better the quality of the representation, the better I should be able to do. Uh, what we'd like to understand is what the shape of that boundary looks like. And we want to try and use information theory to, uh, to, to tell us about uh, both of those questions. So, this is the, uh, the, the motivation the structure of the talk. So we're going to talk, I'm going to spend the first part of the talk um, thinking about classification, and the second part thinking about training. And in the first part, I'm going to make a connection to, to Shannon capacity. Um, Actually, it's going to be the talk's going to be different from the first talk because in the first talk, I I tried to uh, 
do all the details. This talk, I'm going to be very sparing of the details. I'm going to give you an intuition and, and hope to convince you that it's an area that's worth exploring. So in the first part, I'm going to, uh, to talk about connections to, uh, to Shannon capacity. And in the second part, I'm going to try and make a, a connection to rate distortion theory. And in the middle, I'm going to, um, to, to, uh, to make a connection to work of uh, Vadu, Guo, and Shamai about gradient mutual information. So here, I'm going to try and make this connection to Shannon capacity. Um, let, me, let me go back and forth between these two pictures. Um, because, and you can you can all, you can see where I'm 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 heading, right? If you're if you do wireless, then you know about communication over non-coherent wireless channels. So you probably read the work by Shang and Se. And in that work, what they do is they use subspaces to communicate. And so I'm going to be using subspaces to classify. So I have to motivate that for you at the very beginning of this talk. So subspace models have a, a long history in statistics, but let me give you a very particular uh, example. These two papers at the bottom are really interesting. They come from the image processing community. And let me talk about this one, first of all. So what did Basri and Jacob do? Um, they looked at the what happens when you illuminate a convex body. First of all, you have to think about what is illumination? Well, you think about light waves coming from infinity. So I'm going to think about that as <coughs> intensity of illumination on the surface of a sphere. And then I'm going to think, well, what's an image? The light comes in, it reflects off the face, it goes back to the sphere. So in a sense, imaging a convex body is a mapping from one set of intensities on the sphere to another set. What these guys discovered is that if you look at that mapping in the right way, it's incredibly simple. Now the right way turns out to be um, spherical harmonics. So what these guys discovered is that if you look at illumination in that way, it's a illumination is a linear map. And all of the energy is basically confined in about 21 dimensions. So an individual convex body is something like a 9, 10, 11 dimensional subspace of 21 dimensional space. So convex bodies can be thought of as subspaces. So it's a really, um, it's a really pretty paper. Now, you can, you can make an objection. You can say, spherical harmonics. I know what spherical harmonics are. And when I look at the entries in one of those functions, some of them are negative. Well, how do I think about negative illumination? And um, what the second set of authors did was that, they, was that they, they reproduced the results of the first set of authors, but they, they reproduced them with respect to what they call nine points of light. So they have nine real illuminations, and they reproduce the same basic insight. Now, I have to say that there are some caveats. Okay. Um, first caveat is that if you looked at yourself in the mirror this morning, 
you're not a convex body. You have a nose. <laughs> and so that's, so the, the theory is not quite exact. Um, when I'm describing a convex body as a nine-dimensional space, I'm actually neglecting some of the tails. And that's actually important. Because you see, what I'm doing is I'm making a model for the face, for the convex body. And however good a model I make, there's always going to be some gap between the truth and the model that I make. So if I'm thinking in terms of subspaces, I've made a model for your face. And it's not quite the truth. What that means is that if I see you again, you will project onto my model, and most of the energy will be in the projection. But there'll be some that's lost in the residual. So the point at the beginning is that I can't make a perfect model. There's always going to be some mismatch between the truth and the model that I've made. And because I'm a wireless person, I'm going to want to think of that as noise. So the, the basic message of the first part of the talk is that when I'm thinking about making models, there's going to be mismatch between the truth and the model that I make. I'm going to want to think of that mismatch as noise. And when I think about classification as telling subspaces apart, I'm really telling them apart in the presence of noise. And as an information theorist, you know that where there's noise, there is a capacity and you can't do better. And so that's why there's going to be things that Jeff can't do, even if we gave him a really big computer. So that's the... Uh, so, subspace classification. Our signal is going to lie in a union of low-dimensional subspaces. But we want to know which subspace contains the signal. 